Good morning, brothers and sisters. Before we begin or we'll continue our studies on Archbishop Thomas Cranmer with Prophet Italy, let's pray for young people and institutions of learning as an expression of our own loyalty to the youth and our own loyalty to edu institutions of higher learning. Almighty God, the other of all being <clears throat> and our true guide and protector, visit, we pray, our church schools and seminaries of learning. Inspire the teachers with a proper sense of their solemn duties and with grace and strength to fulfill them. May our young people, our children and grandchildren, and great-grandchildren be trained up in thy nurture and admonition. By your sovereign grace, implant in their hearts that fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, and that faith which worketh by love and overcome the world. Help us as seniors, senior officers, to do our duty, that we may exhibit and as examples, these things to our children, grandchildren, and other students. Fill their memories with the word of thy law and thy gospel. Open their understandings to the truth, as it is in Jesus, so that made wise unto salvation, they may escape the pollutions of error and sin, and be strong in thy hands for the maintenance of the pure, undefiled, holy, Catholic, true Catholic, Protestant and Reformed religion among men. Grant this for the sake of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord. Amen. Well, we continue this uh, very small period in Tom Cranmer's life. From late 1529, when he comes to Henry's attention through 1530, in which he is off to the continent with the Earl of Wiltshire. He returns to England in late 1530, Tolberish. And then what goes on into 1531. So we're picking up there. We have a number of uh, pages to go, actually. Um, the significance there, he's appointed the penitentiary uh, Cranmer has made it to Rome, to Rome, and we had some musings on that. We got a happy little granddaughter crying over here in her rocker. Uh, was misunderstood by Fox and his contemporaries as well by as by later historians. Stand by, the prof's going to correct us. They imply that Cranmer was appointed penitentiary at the end, not the beginning of his visit to Rome. And we know that uh, Cranmer's uh, per diem allowance, his daily allowance from Henry, was up in the last six or seven months in light of his more elevated position in the embassy to Rome. It was, some say it was at the end, not the beginning of his visit to Rome and interpret it either as a recognition of his great abilities, which even a grudging Pope was unable to withhold, or as an attempt by the Pope to bribe Cranmer to join his side. In fact, the office was one held by an English representative resident at Rome. So Cranmer's in Rome for how long? And we ask the question, what did he see? What did he know? Did he worship at St. Peter's? I think surely he did. Maybe other churches as well. Whom did he talk to? Who was in the employ of the Vatican at the time? A thousand questions. Did he go to the Vatican Library? Did he do research there? He undoubtedly would have had his own research of documents and his book that he wrote for Henry with him. That would be reasonable. And the duties were to act and connect the granting and drafting of papal dispensational uh, dispensations, or rather, to represent the interests, English interests at court. The appointment was probably always made on the recommendation of the King of England, and the Pope, no doubt, appointed Cranmer as penitentiary, penitentiary, 
main, merely because Henry had requested it. But when Cranmer left Rome in September, Henry asked the Pope to appoint Brother Dionysius, an Italian friar in English pay, to succeed Cranmer as penitentiary. The most important duty Cranmer was required to perform in Italy was to obtain opinions of the universities in a way around the Pope and end run to obtain this opinion in favor of Henry's divorce. The great English tutor is still very much connected to Rome. It's opinion seeking an annulment for the invalidation of the dispensation by Pope Julius II. This was difficult, but by no means an impossible task. In England and France, Henry and uh, Francis had virtually forced the universities to give judgment that Henry's marriage was invalid. In the emperor's territories, the universities were afraid to discuss the question at all. But the emperor's control of Italy it was only indirect, and the rivalries of local Italian politics made it possible for the universities to show some independence. This gave great opportunities for bribery and intrigue, and the English agents resort, resorted to bribery on a large scale. Let's pause how often this goes on even in modern academia Our professors buy a certain line of thinking, think in Princeton Seminary you want to get advanced, you don't pursue the old Princetonian theology probably pay a better price for that I know you will get out in the Presbytery, the Presbytery of Philadelphia in the 1980s prevented a man from being ordained because he held to the deity and Chalcedonian orthodoxy on the on Christology. Forget the names of the man's name. It started with a K. The same thing in the Detroit Presbytery where the Libos controlled people teaching for pay. That's one of the delights I have here in the home library here. Somebody was asking, what's this video film back This is my library. Nobody owns me, not even a bishop. I'm Episcopalian that doesn't control a thing I do or say or read. Government doesn't control me. I don't know about YouTube. Facebook cut me out for 90 days. I still don't know why yet. Nobody controls this scribe. It's beautiful. I have no need of nobody's money. I have an independent passive income that sustains us. Sharon works because she wants to more than needs to. She's just like her father working all day long. He was retired to work all day long after a retirement with the fire department. So... Theology for money, that's an interesting topic and extensive bribes and bombs for favorable university opinions. And that goes on today. We were just talking with my daughter this morning about big money interests controlling the narrative in the media. Zuckerberg or Zucker or something who controls CNN as basically a outlet for democratic politics. It's a proxy voice. Those poor boys and girls there call themselves journalists. They're basically doing the errand, errands, and Zucker. They stray outside that. Editors will bring that man in. That's why you got to have alternate news sources with a variety across the spectrum. <clears throat> money and opinions. But though Cranmer and his colleagues referred to these bribes by the polite name, retainers, 
the euphemism for bribery, the refined art of lying, is called a euphemism. What did Cranmer know? What did he know? He's not a dumb man. We infer here he knew exactly what was going on. Paid on the king's behalf, they made very little attempts to conceal from themselves what they were doing. In March 1530, Cambridge Independent, the Cranmer being in on his travels, but up in England, Cambridge March, the decision of Henry's marriage was against divine law, favoring the Levitical, two Levitical texts that we commented on yesterday. By the beginning of May, <clears throat> Oxford, Orleans, and Andrews had followed suit. So it was a growing uh, argument of the universities in favor of Henry. When the no re news reached Cl Pope Clement in Rome after his usual period of hesitation, as he was doing a nod and a wink to Charles V, issued a brief on 21 May prohibiting the universities from discussing the matter. Well, there's freedom of thought, isn't there? Does it happen today? Why, of course it does. Good and bad. Westminster Theological Seminary, both coasts, requires its men to confess the Roman uh, Westminster Confession of Faith and larger and shorter catechism ex animal. They've had a few over the years that have gone outside that and have had to be cut loose. So there's nothing new here. The Pope's got vast control in the West and he's putting the kibosh on the universities. This was a serious obstacle in the way of attempts of the English agents to obtain similar opinions from the Italian universities. And they set about persuading the Pope to revoke the ban. They asked him to grant a brief with which, without revoking his general prohibition, would permit the matter to be discussed in the Italian universities. What universities? There's one in Naples where Thomas Aquinas taught, but the universities in Rome, Milan, Bologna, where else? Padua. That'd be an interesting study. The Italian universities in the days of Cranmer. And which ones did he visit? We know he was in Rome. Clement, as usual, was vacillating and equivocal. And on the 12th of July, Cranmer wrote from Rome to his colleague, Croak, the eminent Greek scholar in Venice. Croak was in Venice, complaining of the Pope's dishonesty. Let's pause for a minute about Cranmer, who's always this timid, nice, grave and serious man. He was an astute assessor of character. We need to keep that in mind. He knew how to use language to kind of bob and weave, which he'll kind of do with Anne Boleyn's death and with Oliver Cromwell's death. He knows how to thread the needle. Here, and I think this is a worthy point to pause out, or worthy pause to point out that Cranmer was able to spot dishonesty, equivocation, vacillation. And he was an astute judge of character. Those are my views that I'm importing back inwards, onwards, on towards this period of Cranmer in Rome. He told Croak of how his attempts to obtain the desired brief were continually being frustrated by the emperor's ambassador and by Cardinal St. Watuor, who some years before had refused a large bribe to become an English agent. Though Cranmer did not think that they would ever really get a satisfactory brief. 
he was hopeful about obtaining a reasonably useful one. There is a revealing passage in this letter. <clears throat> one of the agents of, in English pay was the aged Friar Francis, a scion of the Venetian aristocracy, who was so, supposed to be persuading the Pope to grant Henry a divorce. But Francis did not seem to be carrying out the duty. Take the money, not do the job. When Cranmer raised the matter with him, the friar explained that when he spoke to the Pope, he pretended to be impartial in the divorce question in the hopes of inducing the Pope to reveal his plans and those of Catherine's supporters. See the papal intrigue going on. Meanwhile, 99% of the people are working and raising their families. Uh, or people that are in the aristocracy and ability to and the banking and the arts and the renaissance has been underway by this point Erasmus is running around to the medieval universities are drinking in the humanistic spirit from Italy to Germany and England think of John Calais at St. Paul's but anyways, we digress. Cranmer approved of this tactic. Well, now. Uh, Tom, the naive one. No. Tom's involved in a plot. It's a postured position. Almost in a way of spying. This kind of alters our view of Tom, doesn't it? Cranmer approved of this tactic and was sure that they could trust Francis, the friar in English employ. Though on Croak's advice, he decided while continuing to employ Francis as an agent, Cranmer was involved in a payoff. Conspiracy, if we could, that's a technical legal term, but trying to get information out of the papal court, out of the Pope to confide in him as little as possible. Cranmer to Croak, there's a footnote here, on 12 July 1530, the date of this letter is given in Croak to Henry VIII, 28 July, 16 days later, 1530, is somewhat incorrectly summarized in LP, which led Pollard to imagine that it was Cranmer, not Francis, who was ill in Rome. This is less than a year after the supper party at Waltham, 15, late 1529, or no, the 2 August 1529 we're referring to. But the Cambridge theologian has become a skillful agent of the king. Pause. I think this is something in my own studies I have not focused enough on. Cranmer's ambassadorial diplomatic competencies. Playing, employing, and paying off an agent to get a papal audience and get Henry's message. You see, he's faithful to Henry here, can't you? The kind of thing that will provoke and invoke in Henry a trust in later years that will help to preserve. Cranmer's life in the prebendary plot of 1540 to 1543. At Waltham, going back to the 2 August 1529 meeting, he had urged that the divorce question should be divided by, decided by the theologians. Now he was working to ensure that it was decided by bri bribing Italian canonists and had learned how to use suspect characters in dishonor honest enterprises without trusting them too far. So bye-bye biography of this naive, timid, time-serving pensioner who couldn't move, couldn't decide. Yeah, he creates that appearance. And we've long held that. Let's add to our list of adjectives that he could be crafty, 
cunning, maybe. Even quasi-deceptive. Whoa. Well, the sins of omission and commission applies to all of us. Let's not get too exalted here. But let's also correct our notions of Cranmer if we can. He was acting on the principle that all means are justified where the king's service is concerned. Wow. Prof. Ridley really lays it on thick here. So, <laughs> we still got several pages to go before we get to 38. We're on 33 and we're learning some th new things here. Some more questions that arise, which we want to take with us into the whole shenanigans of the nullification. Did Cranmer adjust his views on the two texts of Leviticus to the exclusion of the Leveret Law? Deuteronomy 25 for the sake of Henrician approval? It's possible. Very possible that he was scheming. Back to Prof. Ridley, let him talk for a bit. Cranmer had been right in his optimism when he wrote to Croak that he thought he would get a reasonably satisfactory brief. It was issued on 4th, the 4th of August. It declared that the Pope had never intended by his brief, 21 May, to deprive learned men of the right to discuss the issues involved in the divorce case between Henry and Catherine, and that canonists and theologians were free to do so provided they were influenced only by their conscience and not by the money or the remuneration. It is easy to see why Cranmer regarded this brief as being only moderately successful for he can hardly have relished the fact that the Pope had thought it necessary to insert and express statements, statement that the opinions were not to be obtained by bribery. So the Pope knows about the gig, and he's got his fears. Where did the Pope learn this kind of business? It was practiced in the Curia. Well, it's all kinds of political machinations that went on then and go on today. Back to the prof. At the beginning of September, Cranmer left Rome to return to England. On his way, he passed through Bologna and visited Croak. Croak had been having a great deal of trouble in Bologna. The town was in the papal territories and was governed for the Pope by Cardinal de Gambara. Stokesley the new Bishop of London had been there in June and had spent 1,600 crowns in bribing the canonists of the university to support Henry. Well, now, what does that tell us about Stokesley? Bribery? That might be worth going over to one of my legal textbooks. Oh, yeah, we've got a plumber pulling in here. I may have to cut this short. Um, but one of the friars whom Stokesley had bribed had immediately told Cardinal Governor about it. And Gambara thereupon strongly rep reprimanded Croak. Oh, we're talking about Stokesley. I got distracted there. He's going to be an English papist. Bribery in the courts. Well, 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 well. 1,600 crowns that Cranmer called their uh, retainers. That euphemism. Cranmer's got some dirty hands in this. Yeah. We think he supports the king's divorce, but does he really? German Lutherans didn't think it was right. I don't think it was right. 
It's a goofy question. And Henry was looking for a male heir. It was a matter simply of Henry meeting his fornicatory needs. He had access to that on the side. He did with Mary Boleyn and Anne Blount, I think. Well, we got to stop here, brothers and sisters, the plumbers here. Godspeed. Thank you.